welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Good Sunday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with you on this 14th of February. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information. And you can find that on Marine VHF or NOAA Weather Radio and always at weather.gov slash Alaska. If you click on around on the map, you'll find your local zone forecast, as we call it. But if you click on that map one more time, you can localize your information to an exact spot or grid point grid point on that map that will really give you that hyper local forecast information that you're probably really looking for. The weather info lines open at 800-472-0391. You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube during the day. And of course, four o'clock, check in with your daily afternoon map briefing, kind of get a sneak peek at what we're going to talk about here tonight at uh, on Alaska weather. Blizzard warnings continue. We have seen those drop off for the Chukchi Sea Coast as conditions are slowly improving. And they are also improving for the Beaufort Seacoast, but not all the way enough to get rid of those blizzard warnings. Blizzard warnings will continue through tonight. As such, uh, we expect heavy drifting snow. We expect poor visibility at times. The good news is, as I understand, that uh, some flights have been leaving and coming to Barrow, so uh, conditions improving enough for some air traffic to return. But uh, still, blizzard warnings continue for the Beaufort Seacoast there. Now, if you're looking carefully at the map, you can see we've added a new colored section here for St. Lawrence Island and the Bering Strait uh, coastline there. That is a winter storm watch. Uh, this is the precursor to what could become a winter weather advisory or worse, perhaps a winter storm warning or worse still, a blizzard warning. So this is kind of the heads up. We see something coming. In this case, it's going to be wind and probably a decent amount of snow to the region. Strong southerly winds are going to be blowing through here as we get into Monday night and into Tuesday. And as such, we're giving you the heads up. Watch out. There could be some strong weather moving in and it will be wintry and probably windy and snowy. So uh, that watch again for Monday night and into Tuesday for the Bering Strait coastline as well as St. Lawrence Island. So watch out. Here it comes. Where is it right now? Well, if you look out to the west, you can't see a whole lot on the map, but look at some of these brighter white clouds moving their way toward uh, the western Aleutians and the western Bering Sea. That is the beginnings of a storm system that should power up fairly quickly as we head into the next couple of days. So nothing much on the map yet, but it should just steam right across the Bering as we get into Monday night, Tuesday and into Wednesday. In the meantime, you're looking at the north slope and you can still see a circulation sitting up here across the Chukchi Sea. It has a little bit of a boundary to it that's been working its way eastward and it's starting to fall apart. This is all beginning to mix up a little bit. There's still plenty of cold air here across the Chukchi Sea and we still have some bands of snow working their way out across the north slope. The winds are still there, but a lot of those conditions all in one spot, like they seem to be right over Barrow yesterday, uh, are starting to ease up ever so slightly. And as that continues, then those blizzard warnings will eventually be dropped, but they're still in effect now. Across South Central, a lot of cloud cover as seen by the satellite's eye, but not a whole lot of precipitation, at least across South Central in the Susitna Valley and the Matanuska Valley. There's an opportunity for rain and snow showers across southwestern Alaska today, tonight, and tomorrow. Across the northern Gulf Coast and into southeast, we see some pockets of clouds. A frontal boundary stretching its way up across southeast, starting to break some of the clouds up around the Dixon entrance as the system moves in. It will gradually lift northward and kind of expand and mix up again, so we'll lose that uh, punch that it may have had for the last day or so, but uh, conditions will gradually ease up there. Here's a look at the frontal map and you can see low pressure at 994 millibars across the eastern gulf. Uh, we're going to call this a cold front right now. There's certainly colder air behind it and it's trying to move eastward, but uh, this should gradually diminish and fall apart as we head through tonight and tomorrow. Low pressure sitting across the uh, Bristol Bay region, creating rain and snow in some cases. Not a whole lot there right now. Most of that looks fairly light. 
Uh, around Prince William Sound, some pockets of rainfall there into the front that's stretching into southeast and a wave of low pressure here around Dutch Harbor in Alaska sitting at 983 millibars and just on the very far edge of your screen you might not even be able to see it. Warmer air is trying to lift eastward. That will start to creep a little bit further east later tonight and make its way in towards Shemya at to maybe as far as Kiska by early tomorrow morning. That will bring more clouds, maybe some fog as well as some pockets of rainfall that will gradually increase as you head into uh, Monday and Tuesday. Showers of rain mainly for southeast and the northern Gulf Coast might see that mix in a little bit more as you get into southwestern Alaska and the peninsula as well as the central Aleutians. Out across the west coast, lingering snow showers from the Yukon Delta through Norton Sound and into the Chukchi Sea coast. Most of that fairly light and we're still watching the pressure gradient. You can kind of do the math at home there by seeing those black lines smushed together. The tighter they are, the more the wind's going to blow and we're still looking at those blowing winds tonight, which means more drifting of snow. Now, it may not reach that blizzard criteria on the paper. However, if it's blowing and drifting around and you can't see, don't go. That's a dangerous situation and, of course, will not aid in uh, making things easier to travel anytime soon. Snow showers continue north of the Yukon Valley up toward Arctic Village with low pressure creeping eastward along the uh, southern slopes of the Brooks Range out across the west. Low pressures down to 964 millibars. This is the next wave we're going to watch. As this works across the bearing, it's going to line up right here across the west coast and likely uh, create an opportunity for some heavier snowfall across the western Bering Strait uh, communities as well as St. Lawrence Island and maybe even the western tip of the Yukon. It just depends on how much warm air is still in place and we're being drawn up by the time this frontal boundary gets here. So keep an eye on that as we go. We'll have another map here in just a minute. Across the central Aleutians, you can see a better chance for rainfall developing as probably some high-end gales are working across the central chain. Low pressure across the central Gulf starting to stretch back out again at 986 millibars. This will start to push some stronger southerly winds into southern parts of southeast as we get into Monday and Tuesday. But overall, it doesn't look like we're going to get a big, strong wind for most of Monday, that is. For rain and snow showers across northern parts of south Southeast, all the way around the northern Gulf Coast. Same old story still playing out as we start up the next work week and snow showers will be possible across the Alaska range and all the way around to the west with lingering clouds across most of southwest, the interior and the north slope. And there's what we're looking for. Finally, a relaxed pressure gradient across the northern slope. With that, the winds should start to ease up. There will still be some blowing and drifting of snow, but it should not be as bad as what we've seen over the last 24 to 48 hours. And then it's back for Tuesday. Look, the gradient's tightening up once again. Pockets of snow across the Chukchi Sea coast, uh, all the way from Point Barrow westward toward Wainwright. But really what we notice out across the Bering Strait, especially the western coast from the Seward Peninsula to St. Lawrence Island to uh, the Yukon Delta and southward, we're starting to see a pretty healthy southerly flow crank up across the west coast. So there is our potential for some strong winds across of the Seward Peninsula and St. Lawrence Island. And if this gets into heavy snow production, that certainly could bring on blizzard potential there. So we're going to watch that very carefully. Right now, a winter storm watch is posted. And out across the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta, rain and rain mixed with snow. And the further you get toward the Norton Sound region, the better chance that's going to be snow. Gales probably across the central eastern Aleutians and the southern tip of the Alaska Peninsula. And then colder winds coming in behind that with snow showers from Kiska all the way out toward Adak and maybe even Shemya to the west. Low pressures falling apart across the central uh, and southern parts of southeast, 998 millibars. That low pressure won't be much to talk about after Tuesday, but the front there is still capable of producing some rainfall there. And things clear out. Colder winds uh, at times for some parts of the Alaska range, but things really start to clear up as we get into Tuesday afternoon for South Central, so at least you'll see some sunshine. Clouds linger across the Yukon Valley with snow showers in the region. That's a look at your weather map as we go into Tuesday. Let's take a look at today. 40s for most of Southeast today. The capital city, 41, 45 in Sitka. Lower 40s for southern parts of Southeast. Ketchikan, Craig, Klawak, 39 in Valdez, 34 in Anchorage. Lower 40s in Homer. Seward only 34 with rain and snow mix. 13 in Fairbanks, 19 for Eagle today, 14 in Fort Yukon. And Kodiak on the other end around 40 degrees. 10 in Arctic Village. Single digits for the North Slope. Point Barrow around 0, 08 for Kaktovik. One below in Kivalina. Seven below in Kotzebue. And it was one above in Nome today. Uh, Unalakleet was 15 degrees. About the same as McGrath. Galena showing 20. Grayling 25, 23 in Bethel. 19 around Nunavak Island. And one above 
for St. Lawrence Island today, a little four below, a little bit further on the end. Uh, four, lo, 42 there in Akiak, uh, around uh, the Pribloffs, 36 to about 37 degrees today, close to 40 for the Alaska Peninsula. King Salmon and Dillingham in the upper 30s with 41 in Unalaska and Dutch Harbor. Adak was 36, 37 in Atka, and 32 in Attu. Now, South Central uh, tonight will likely dip into the upper 20s and lower 30s. A few places a little bit milder, like uh, Kodiak at 34. Mid to upper 30s for most of Southeast. A few locations closing in on 40 degrees on the outer coast. Into the interior, 5 below in Fairbanks and Arctic Village. 3 below for Barrow. Kotzebue Sound temperatures 5 to 10 below. 6 below in Nome. 13 above around Amonic. And uh, the Bristol Bay region just below freezing for most places tonight. 30 in St. Paul, upper 30s for the Alaska Peninsula and mid 30s for the central and western chain with highs tomorrow. Recovering just a little bit more, closer to 40 there. 33 in St. Paul and St. George, 21 for Nunavak Island, 6 in Savunga, 2 above in Barrow with Kotzebue looking at temperatures closer to 10. Around Arctic Village, 11 above. Uh, once you get into the Tanana Valley, you're still looking at temperatures in the uh, mid to upper teens, maybe lower 20s. South Central in the lower to mid 30s with Kodiak Island closer to 40. And Southeast, expect highs in the upper 30s to mid 40s for your daytime tomorrow. Flying weather shows improvement across the North Slope, especially for the Beaufort Seacoast, but IFR conditions will linger for the Chukchi Seacoast tomorrow. You can see the building of clouds and moisture working in across the western Bering Sea. For the central Aleutians, IFR conditions will develop, as well as parts of Bristol Bay and uh, Cape Newenham eastward toward Dillingham. IFR conditions out across the central Gulf and across some areas in the interior for the uh, south central region, as well as around Haines, Juneau, and perhaps Skagway as well. Flying weather shows your Anaktuvik Pass looking, uh, eh, okay, marginal. MVFR expected for most of the daytime tomorrow and for Adigan Pass. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass will start at IFR with some improvements noted throughout the afternoon. We expect similar conditions in Rainy Pass with a start at IFR for uh, your President's Day. Windy Pass, expect IFR to start your Monday. MVFR conditions there. Isabel Pass could be IFR through a large part of the day. Watch for some gradual improvements in the afternoon if we're lucky. And Tasta Pass, VFR so far. Uh, meant Tanita Pass, we expect to see marginal conditions through most of the day. Portage Pass, IFR to start, maybe some improvement during the afternoon. And Chilkoot and White Pass right now looking to be IFR through a large part of the day. The freezing levels show warmer air is quickly building in from the south and west out of the North Pacific and heading for the Bering. You can see the warm air across the Gulf also spreading out. The surface freezing line across the Bering also jogging northward ever so slightly. Icing potentials lining up along the front above 3,000 feet right now out across the west affecting Atka tomorrow and maybe Adak. Uh, three to 4,000 feet across the Alaska Range and the Cook Inlet region with occasional moderate there. Above 4,000 feet for some parts of the southern Gulf as well. So a little bit of moisture, but it's spread out across a lot of places there that could reach some very low end moderate tomorrow. Tomorrow's jet stream shows a large digging trough across the North Pacific and the Gulf with low pressure pretty much in the same old place. But we're going to watch the power coming out of the North Pacific jet as we head into the beginning of the week. Right now, those winds coming in at 140 to 150 knots are driving in that next storm very quickly. 50 to 75 knots out across the North Pacific and the Western Bering at 9,000 feet. Winds are light across the interior, stronger across the Bering Strait at 20 knots and low pressure driving in winds across southern parts of the Panhandle really slows down as they hit the the ridge 50 knots there coming in from the south and then dying off to about 10 to 20 knots there at 3,000 feet you can see the winds cranking up across the western bearing at 50 knots they're slow right now across the west coast 5 to 10 and light winds across the interior only 10 knots there but a steady east and southeast wind picks up across the north slope to 50 knots north of point barrow so we're still watching for turbulence there below 3,000 feet at across the central and western chain that should be uh, on the increase as we head into the next several days above 2,000 feet and still watching for some chop above 2,000 feet across the Dixon entrance region and the outer coast. That's a look at your aviation forecast. I'll be back with your marine weather in the sea ice edge in just a few minutes. Obstacles are a fact of life and of aviation. Obstacles can pop up at the most inconvenient and downright dangerous times. Towers, mountains, trees, all kinds of adversity. Anything in the vicinity of the end of a runway that sticks up above the airport elevation is a potential obstruction. Of most concern are trees growing in the line of a runway's approach or departure path. 
Obstacle clearance was cited as the cause of 2.5% of all takeoff accidents. That may not sound like much, but consider the relatively small number of takeoffs performed at airports with obstructions and the relatively small number of such airports. Compare those figures to the many more airports with adequate safety zones and the numbers of operations performed there. Obstructed takeoffs are riskier. Obstructed takeoffs require short field procedures. Use all the runway for takeoff. Rotate at the recommended speed for short field and climb at the best angle of climb speed, VX. VX will result in a higher deck angle and that can be unnerving if you're not used to it. Maintain VX until clear of the obstacle, then transition to best rate of climb, VY, or cruise climb speed for better cooling and better visibility over the nose. The POH can give you the numbers for the distance to land over the mythical 50-foot obstacle. To give yourself a margin of safety when calculating your total landing distance, add 50% to the landing distance over a 50-foot obstacle from the POH. Earlier, we talked about developing personal performance figures for the POH. Do it for obstructed takeoffs and landings, too. To determine landing distance, come over the runway threshold at the proper airspeed and 50 feet AGL, above ground level. See how far down the runway you touch down. Speed control is critical. Too fast, and you may not have enough runway to stop. Too slow, and you may not make it to the runway. Fortunately, few pilots are banging into things on the way into airports. Obstructions don't show up as a category of landing accident. But inasmuch as runway length is an accident category, we have to ask if the need to get over some obstacles on approach caused some of the pilots of accident airplanes to run out of runway. Look at that windsock. It's pointing almost straight across the runway. Strong crosswinds are a difficult weather condition. We know they make good landings a challenge, but they complicate takeoffs, too. Wind conditions are the third leading cause of takeoff accidents. Just as you do during approach, you've got to compensate for the wind during takeoff roll and climb. Practice on the way to the runway by keeping control surfaces properly oriented to the wind while taxiing. Remember, elevator neutral and aileron into direct crosswinds. Climb into quartering headwinds and dive away from them. This will minimize the chance of upset and help you think about the wind direction and get you ready to counter it on takeoff. As you begin the takeoff roll, the aileron should be deflected full into the wind. Their effectiveness increases with speed, so decrease aileron deflection as the airplane accelerates. At liftoff, one wing will be low and opposite rudder pressure will be maintaining the forward flight path. Essentially, you'll be in a slip transition into a crab for the climb. Point the nose into the wind at the angle that will keep your track aligned with the runway. Strong winds are often gusty winds, and that calls for additional considerations. Just as you add extra knots on approach, do the same on takeoff in gusty conditions. Keep the aircraft on the ground longer to get more speed before rotation. Some pilots use a little less nose-up trim to help keep it on the ground, and a little more back pressure for rotation. Once off the runway, climb briskly to put some distance between you and the ground. And maintain an adequate airspeed in the climb to account for the gusts as you do on approach. You know, one of the most common landing mistakes in general aviation, the gear up landing. Gear up landings usually occur because pilots are distracted from their normal routine. That's why checklist discipline is essential in preventing these incidents. This pilot knew he had a problem with the gear. That's why he's landing on the grass. The first concern is the safety of all those on board, and these two walked away unharmed. The good news? Gear up landings rarely cause any injuries besides damage to the pilot's ego. But you owe your airplane better treatment than that, don't you think? Remember, gear down in advance. Gump on final, always. This is it, the one that makes the palms sweat, the crosswind landing. But first, a word of advice. You can't make a good crosswind landing if you don't survive the turn to final. Be sure to account for the wind in the pattern. If it blows you past the approach path, there's a tendency to try to make a steep turn to get back on final. Many pilots have lost it in cross-control stall mishaps. 
As in all landings, first consider the factors you'd account for in a totally benign situation. Landing point, runway surface, target speeds, then add in the X factor or factors. In this case, the crosswind. Once on final, are you going to crab or slip to keep the flight path aligned with the runway? This question has been fodder for endless pilot lounge discussion, and the answer is essentially a matter of preference. Some pilots are uncomfortable with the cross controls needed for side slips, and so prefer the crab. The crab simply requires pointing the nose of the plane toward the wind to account for drift and keep the flight path aligned with the runway. However, the pilot is going to have to make the transition from the crab to the slip before landing to get the nose of the plane pointed down the runway. If you land in the crab, the plane may go off the side of the runway during the landing roll or landing gear tires may peel off their wheels. Those who prefer to slip all the way down final say they like having time getting a feel for the controls in the slip instead of transitioning from a crab in the last seconds of flight. The descent rate will be a little greater in a slip, but not by much. Some POHs advise against slipping the aircraft with full flaps or when fuel falls below a certain level because lateral inertial forces may move fuel away from the fuel lines to the engine, resulting in power loss. Whether you crab or slip, you'll have to adjust control inputs to account for the changes in wind speed and direction as you descend. If conditions are gusty, add half the difference between the wind speed and peak gusts to your usual approach speed. Don't try to finesse the approach in a gusty crosswind. This is nasty stuff. The airplane will probably be bucking and bouncing around the approach path. That's okay, just ride it down. This is not the time for a full stall landing, but you should still land on the mains with the nose wheel slightly higher. What about flaps? You hear lots of discussion among pilots about whether to use full flaps in gusty crosswinds. The argument against full flaps is that it just provides more surface area the gusts and crosswinds can push against, and the lower approach speed associated with full flaps may not be sufficient to maintain crosswind control. The argument for full flaps? Well, full flaps will lower your stall speed. And it also gives you a better view of the runway because it pitches the nose down. The POH will be your guide for flap use in various conditions. When wind conditions permit, the Air Safety Foundation recommends using full flaps for landings. If you think the crosswind is too strong for full flaps, give some thought to finding a runway more aligned with the wind. If you have to land with a strong crosswind, you should use the minimum flap for runway length. Time now for a quick look at your sea ice edge, and the ice is about 30 to 40 nautical miles away from St. Matthew, at least where the higher concentration is above 80%. If you go down to St. Paul, the edge is about 130 to 140 nautical miles, so there's still quite a bit of distance there. Hopefully all the crabbing folk are enjoying that. Hopefully it's working out for you. But the ice edge is slowly advancing to the south and west. Really no major changes in what we've been talking about for the last couple days. As we see those stronger winds come in from the south, though, no doubt we're going to have some changes in the ice as we get into the next couple days. So keep your eyes on that if it matters to what you're doing in the Bering Sea. Monday's forecast in southeast, northerlies coming down Lynn Canal and through Cross Sound and Stevens Passage, about 15 knots with 3 to 4 foot sea. Southeasterlies coming up clear and straight at 20. Offshore winds will blow from 10 to as strong as 30 knots as you head south of Sitka with higher gusts expected. 12 to 13 foot seas there up the southern outer coast. By Tuesday, there's an opportunity for isolated thunderstorms uh, outside of Craig and Cloak. 30 knots there with a 14 foot sea. Easterlies still blowing at 25 knots south of Sitka. And northeasterly winds coming into the low pressure system still hovering off the outer coast. Look for northerlies to pick up on the inner side uh, passages there, 25 knots through uh, Stevens Passage and Cross Sound as well. A southeasterly wind still going at 30 knots with a six foot sea inside of Clarence Strait. For south central, look for light winds, even variable flow west of the Barrens and Chelikoff Strait, only 10 knots on the inside with two foot sea. Southwesterlies also remain light in the north and western Gulf. Easterlies, 10 knots with a two foot sea inside of Prince William Sound tomorrow. And for Tuesday, a little bit more of a northerly shift, but not much of a change in speed. 15 to 25 knots across the north and western Gulf, seas 6 to 7 feet there. Winds start to pick up south of Calgan Island, 20 knots all the way down to the Barrens with a 2 to 5 foot sea and still light and variable flow inside of Shelikov Strait for Tuesday. Look for light winds for Bristol Bay and all the way down the Bering Sea coast for the Alaska Peninsula and in the Pacific coast, a little bit of a southerly push there as we get into the afternoon, 10 to 15 knots with an 8 to 10 foot sea. Look for those winds to come up as we head into Tuesday. 
For uh, Bristol Bay, southeasterlies at 25, southerlies a little bit further down the coast, 20 to 30 knot winds from Castle Cape all the way down toward King Cove and False Pass with 7 to 10 foot seas developing. For the Aleutians, a south and westerly wind from Nikolsky all the way out toward Kiska and Attu, a 30 to 35 knot wind there with 9 to 15 foot seas developing. Northwesterlies north of Unalaska and Nikolsky with a 7 foot sea, south and westerlies on the Pacific coast with 8 to 9 foot seas there by Tuesday. Everyone's getting in on the stronger wind, 30 knots from Unalaska all the way out toward Kiska with 16 foot seas there in the west and up to 40 knots around Attu and Shemia with a 22 foot sea expected by Tuesday afternoon. For the west coast, north and easterlies at 15 to 20 around St. Matthew an easterly flow at 30 knots with a 7 foot sea and more of a light and variable flow continuing for St. Paul and St. George with a 4 foot sea on Monday. By Tuesday southerlies are taking over ahead of the advancing front coming in from the west. With that we expect stronger winds in the Kuskokwim Delta region 40 knots with a 10 foot sea and southeasterlies north of Nunavak Island to St. Lawrence Island. But again that's going to have some impacts on the ice there as we're moving in warmer air and again that southerly wind will advance any looser ice northward as well. So keep your eyes on the ice edge. Across the north slope, easterly is moving across the Beaufort Sea, still blowing at 30 knots tomorrow. So there will still be some blowing and drifting snow. Look for easterlies around Wainwright. Northwesterlies, though, coming into Cape Lisburn, Point Hope, and Kotzebue Sound at 15 to 20. For Tuesday, winds are diminishing, but still blowing 20 to 25 across the north slope. Easterlies developing from Wainwright to Cape Lisburn, and a southeasterly offshore wind for Kotzebue Sound on Tuesday. Here's our forecast for tonight. Blizzard warnings continue for the Beaufort Seacoast again through tonight and into early tomorrow morning. Look for pockets of rain and snow showers across the north and eastern coast, including southeastern Alaska and Kodiak Island. Weak low pressures hovering across the southern tip of the Alaska Peninsula, and there could be some snow showers around the Yukon Delta, north through Norton Sound, Seward Peninsula, and into Kotzebue Sound. A stronger storm, though, is developing out across the west, and we'll watch this with a winter storm watch for the western tip of the Seward Peninsula and the Bering Strait communities, as well as St. Lawrence Island. This could bring some strong winds and periods of snow to the region as we head into uh, Monday night and Tuesday, so keep your eyes on that system as it develops. By Tuesday, it should be in place, creating a very healthy southerly flow across the Aleutians, the Alaska Peninsula, the YK Delta, at least the further western tip, and into Norton Sound and the western tip of the Seward Peninsula. Otherwise, things are fairly quiet for most of the interior, with winds occasionally blustery on the north slope. That's your Alaska weather, and thanks for watching. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.